Thank you for taking the time to tune in. I'm Reverend O'Lear, the Director of Evangelical Mission and the Associate with the Bishop in the Upstate New York Synod. There will be two readings for today, and the primary one I will read here, but the Luke text, chapter 4, will be within the sermon itself. Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept. When we remembered Zion, we hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For there, those who carried us away captive asked of us a song. And those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. Remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it to its very foundation. O daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed, happy the one who repays you as you have served us. Happy the one who takes and dashes your little ones against the rock. Will you take a moment to pray with me? Loving and liberating God, you who desire the freedom and flourishing of all creation, manifest yourself among us as we worship you today. On this observance of the emancipation of enslaved African people in this country, prepare our hearts to hear and receive what your spirit will say to us through the word, prayers, and song, as well as the sermon. Clarify our vision so that we may recognize and equally regard the humanity of all people. Reorient our hearts and our minds so that after we depart from this service, we may continue your ministry of justice, liberation and love to and for all in this country and the world. It is in the name of Jesus the Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit we pray. Amen. I'd like to share with you a poem from the Book of Poverty and Death. And it is written by the artist, uh, an artist, uh, mystic Rainier Relk. Now his poetry has often been written as poems of devotion to God. This one is called, You Are the Poor One. Now I want you to note, however, that he uses two words, invalid and homeless in his work, where we now know that using person first or identity first language is more affirming, or using words like unhoused. But here is his work. You are the poor one, you the destitute. You are the stone that has no resting place. You are the diseased one whom we fear to touch only the wind is yours. You are the poor like the spring rain that gently caresses the city, like wishes muttered in a prison cell without a world to hold them. And like the invalid turning in his bed to ease the pain like flowers along the track shuddering as the train roars by and like the hand that covers our face when we cry that poor. Yours is the suffering of birds on freezing nights, of dogs who go hungry for days. Yours the long sad waiting of animals who are locked up and forgotten. You are the beggar who averts his face, the homeless person who has given up asking. You howl in the storm. Now, 
This radical identification of God with the lowly, the downcast, the forgotten is a core theme running like a vein of gold through the gospels in Jesus's ministry. It is magnified by the diversity of the downtrodden with whom Jesus spent his time, his tax collectors, sex workers, those that are impoverished, persons with different abilities and those that are disenfranchised of his day. And today we commemorate Juneteenth. Now for those who do not know the meaning of Juneteenth, it originated in Galveston, Texas. It had been celebrated annually on June 19th, thus Juneteenth, in various parts of the United States since 1865. You know, the day was recognized as a federal holiday, June 17th, 2021, when President Joe Biden signed the Juneteenth National Independence Day Act into law. Now, Juneteenth's commemoration is on the anniversary date of June 19th, 1865 when the Union Army General Gordon Granger, proclaiming freedom for enslaved people in Texas, which was the last state of the Confederacy with institutional slavery. Now you may be thinking, what? Wait, weren't slaves freed two years earlier when Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation was issued on January 1st, 1863? No. Not really. You see, although the Emancipation Proclamation brought an end to slavery in the Confederate States, it did not end slavery in states that remained in the Union. Those enslaved people were freed with the ratification of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which on December 6, 1865, abolished slavery nationwide. Now, speaking of enslaved persons, the psalm we heard today was a rather graphic one. The image of dashing the oppressor's children against rocks being one of the more graphic images in the Bible. This psalm is an expression of grief and anger, expressing the feelings of a people taken into captivity. They had lost everything their homeland, pillaging and a horrid and violent taking of a entire people. As one commentator explains it, Psalm 137 is the human response to that violence and struggle. It's a refusal to do what their captors wanted, a mourning of those caught in captivity and the expression of a desire for revenge. It is intensely human. For people of color, African Americans in this country, the stories told to them by their parents and their parents' parents would not be dissimilar. Stories of injustices, captivity, violence, and devastation. Of a slave trade that plagued this land from before its founding until 1865, all by a land that considered itself a nation of Christians but yet we still have the Tulsa Race Massacre, 1921, and Rosewood in 1923, the riots of 1917, and the destruction of Seneca Village, 1857. Now, I would be remiss that these stories of captivity and violence and devastation also was plagued upon our indigenous brothers and sisters right here, even for the Haudenosaunee people all over these Americas. And today we are seeing it across the waters in the Congo and in Palestine, but that is for another sermon. And while truth of what has happened in this country and continues, the fact is we have distorted the truth of Christianity through our very sinfulness. You see, Christianity is that it is a religion of liberation founded on teachings of justice, mercy, and breaking the bonds of intolerance and oppression. But often in our churches, in our leadership, we participate in a culture of paternalism, either or thinking or individualism over community. 
But if we go back to our text, we can even see when in the song of Mary, where Mary sings before Jesus' birth, that he has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. We see this as a message of liberation in the song of Zechariah, which he sang at the naming and circumcision of John the Baptist, Jesus's cousin. This was the oath we swore to our father Abraham to set us free from the hands of our enemies. But we see this most clearly in our gospel lesson. It was so very carefully orchestrated by Jesus. And Jesus was no stranger to utilizing dramatic effect. This text, this gospel lesson, it says he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. He enrolls it, all eyes are on him, dead silence I can only imagine. Now mind you, Hebrew does not have paragraph breaks, punctuation and the like. So it takes a moment or two I can imagine as he unrolls the scroll and searches for the specific scripture he wished to read. And the Bible says this, he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. This probably wasn't the scripture they expected to be read. The room, possibly dead silent, as Jesus is seated. And then the scripture goes on to say, then he began to say to them today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. He could have chosen any scripture, but this is a text he chose. Hear it again. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You see, church, in reading this, Jesus identifies himself as the anointed, the Messiah, and he identifies why he has come. And Jesus was quite confrontational in his day of the powers that be, clashing with religious hypocrisy and confronting the injustices of the Roman Empire, which occupied his people. He clashed with systems that oppressed People, religious and secular, there was no playing nice with that. And Jesus's clash with the empire was clear to his followers. And ultimately, Jesus' ministry led to his death at the hands of that same empire. His followers understood that the message of liberation, that was the good news. And they clashed with Rome, unwilling to relent in preaching the good news of equality. The text says, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female for all of you are one in Jesus Christ. But we have this split. And many of our early disciples and early Christians died a martyr's death. They knew they stood in the lineage of prophets who were calling God's people to justice and mercy. Jesus, the prophet of prophets, 
And Jesus died this prophet's death just as many before him and many since. And the prophet Amos is kind of like, for me, uh, the prophet Kendrick Lamar of biblical times. <laughs> Sharing the message from God quotes the Lord as saying, I hate, I despise your festivals. And I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your heart but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Justice. It is justice that God seeks. You know, Oscar Romero, a bishop in the Roman Catholic Church um, in El Salvador said this, a religion of Sunday mass, but unjust weeks does not please the Lord. He also speaks very profoundly of a gospel of liberation where he says, a church that doesn't provoke any crisis, a gospel that doesn't unsettle, a word of God that doesn't get under anyone's skin, a word of God that doesn't touch the real sin of the society in which it is being proclaimed. What gospel is that? Our faith is not here to make us feel comfortable and to ease our conscience. It is here to transform us and to transform this world. We cannot pray in the Lord's prayer for God's kingdom to come here on earth as it is in heaven if we are working in ways contrary to it. Otherwise, we are worse kind of hypocrites, the kind in whom Jesus clashed with. I like the message version of Amos. It's not a, you know, it's just as rendering, right? In modern language. And for Amos 521, um, in a more modern context, it says this, I can't stand your religious meetings. I'm fed up with your conferences and conventions. I want nothing to do with your religion projects, your pretentious slogans and goals. I'm sick of your fundraising schemes, your public relations and image making. I've had all I can take of your knee, noisy ego music. When was the last time you sang to me? Do you know what I want? I want justice, oceans of it. I want fairness, rivers of it. That's what I want. That's all that I want. What I am finding more and more while I work within this three expressions of the church is that many of our leaders do not want to confront the hard realities that do not directly impact them. They would rather stay in the comfort of their seats and think that they can't create comfort and discomfort in a healthy way. What many times happens as form of comfort when it doesn't impact us is just like what happened to the enslaved persons in Texas that didn't know that they were free. But when we are free of mind and heart, we are freed people that free people. And Christianity is not just concerned with matters of social justice, rather Christianity is a commitment to confronting injustice. That is our Lutheran faith. And Jesus modeled this and he clashed with oppressive systems. You know, the first few hundred years of Christianity modeled a radical faith committed to the work of justice, mercy, and confronting the evil of its day. And there are glimpses of it. Don't let me say that it is not. But when Constantine 
came up with a brilliant plan to squash this threatening movement. He made Christianity like his bedfellow and watered down the faith, institutionalizing this previously radical movement. And by and large, Christianity has remained this watered down, complacent to patriarchy, misogyny, slavery, crusades, white supremacy culture, consecrating countless wars, and so much more. Christianity, Christianity is a religion of the people, by the people, for the people. And the radical roots of our religion are being reclaimed. I believe that now. And if we look back in the March of, in March of 1965, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had an essay published, Let Justice Roll Down. And he wrote these words, the fluidity and instability of American public opinion on questions of social change is very marked. There would have been no civil rights progress, nor nuclear test ban treaty without resolute presidential leadership. The issues which must be decided are momentous. The contest is not tranquil and relaxed. The search for a consciousness will tend to become a quest for the least common denominator of change. In an atmosphere devoid of urgency, the American people can easily be stupefied into accepting slow reform, which in practice would be inadequate reform. Let justice roll down like waters in a mighty stream, said the prophet Amos. He was seeking not consensus, but the cleansing action of revolutionary change. America has made progress toward freedom, but measured against the goal, the road ahead is still long and hard. There is still great work before us, beloveds. And may we work not for slow reform, but that cleansing action of revolutionary change of which King speaks to. But there is at least one more piece to this equation. As we work to break the chains of oppression in our own day, following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, let us also remember that all oppressors are themselves slaves to some fear, anger, bigotry, and hatred. And let us remember that they too are our brother and sisters on a path towards redemption. And as Ruth King says, racism and you fill in the blank is a heart disease, but it's curable. But peace is a product of justice, but justice is not enough. Love is also necessary. The love that makes us feel that we are brothers and sisters in properly what makes for true peace. Peace is the product of justice and love. Caught in a network of interconnection and dependency until we are all free. None of us are free. May we therefore continue the good work and continue to bring the good news. Together, may we seek justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. Thanks be to God. Amen.